At 20 past six on the morning of the 20th of November, 1917, German sentries heard a grinding, screeching roar through the mist that cloaked the fields around Cambrai. Soon they saw dozens of strange metal shapes churning their way through the wire that protected their position. Many soldiers fled in terror before this mechanized onslaught. By nightfall, the tanks had pushed over four miles into the German lines. It was such a dramatic success that church bells were rung in England for the first time in the war. But 24 hours after the attack, most of the tanks had broken down or been destroyed. Worse, the British could not exploit the breakthrough because there were no troops to do it. The commander-in-chief, Sir Douglas Haig, had seen Cambrai more as a test for the tank than as a means of breaking the Western Front. By early December, the Germans had taken back most of the ground that they'd lost. They'd also captured 50 British tanks, and in the time taken to paint an iron cross on their sides, they turned them against their former owners. Pirating British tanks was not going to win the war for Germany. Ludendorff, the army's key senior commander, saw victory slipping from his grasp. America had declared war on Germany in April 1917. Every month, more and more American troops were transfused into France, like blood into a dying patient. If Germany was to win the war, she must do so quickly, before the patient became too strong. Late in 1917, Ludendorff met his senior advisers here in the Belgian town of Mons he decided to stake everything on the biggest German offensive of the war. It was called the Kaiserschlacht, the Kaiser's Battle. To fight it, the Germans would need a blood transfusion themselves. It would come in the form of a million battle-hardened soldiers from the Eastern Front, fresh from their victories over the Russians. The Germans would strike along a 40-mile front near St. Quentin. It was here that the British and French armies met, and the British were at their weakest. While the Germans were preparing their massive offensive, the British were trying to bolster the sketchy defences on these wind-scoured slopes. They'd inherited this sector of the front, opposite St Quentin, from the French just a few months before. The British Army urgently needed men to replace the casualties of Passchendaele. Men to dig trenches. Men to lay barbed wire. Some of the divisions in this sector were at less than half their normal strength. But the British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, would not give Haig the men he wanted. Lloyd George blamed Haig for the losses at Passchendaele and the failure at Cambrai. There would be no more men for costly, long, drawn-out battles. British defences in this sector, overlooking St Quentin, were based on a series of isolated strongpoints on high ground. They were called redoubts, and they were sighted to cover one another with machine gun fire. I'm standing on one, and there's another just over there, in the trees behind the water tower. There were trenches on the ground between the redoubts, but they were thinly held. It looked better on a trench map than in real life. Trenches were shallow and the barbed wire was thin and soldiers didn't like the redoubts. It don't suit us, grumbled one experienced NCO. The British Army fights in line and won't do any good in these bird cages. While the British dug, the Germans drilled. Senior German officers had complained that by 1917, their army was a mere militia. Morale had been hit by the terrible fighting at Passchendaele, and discipline was patchy. Behind the lines, Ludendorff cracked down, and even had soldiers goose-stepping in the traditional German parade march. 
younger soldiers were formed into elite assault battalions of stormtroopers. They were given the pick of new equipment and weapons like this Bergman submachine gun, capable of fully automatic fire and far more useful in a close quarter brawl than rifle and bayonet. By early 1918, the Germans were more than just well trained and well equipped. Reinforcements from the East made them unusually strong and most German soldiers knew that if they were to ever win the war, it must be now. The British expected the attack. Sir Hubert Goff, the local commander, knew that the Germans would strike around St Quentin. He shared his fears with Haig, but had neither time nor resources to make full preparations. On the 18th of March, part of 16th Battalion, the Manchester Regiment, moved up into the forward zone. It was led by Lieutenant Colonel Wilfrith Elstob, a big, burly former schoolmaster, who joined the battalion as a private soldier in 1914. Their band played them out of camp. And as it turned back, Elstob said, those are the only fellows who'll come out of this alive. His men held the redoubt on Manchester Hill, a wide circle of trenches surrounded by wire. Elstob's headquarters was down in this quarry and he had a forward command post to use when the fighting started. He'd shown his men the position on a map, concluding, this is battalion headquarters. Here we fight and here we die. Early on the morning of the 21st of March, six and a half thousand German guns opened fire. The four-hour barrage was more intense and more accurate than ever before. The Germans had used aerial reconnaissance to target each gun in advance. The defenders were muffled up in their gas masks, while their whole world roared and shuddered. However terrible the bombardment, the German infantry knew that surviving British machine guns would open up the second that they left the safety of these trenches. But the Germans were lucky. Instead of advancing into a hail of machine gun bullets, they walked into a protective blanket of fog. In their hilltop fortresses, the British were blind. The first Germans slipped like wraiths through the gaps in the line. Ludendorff's plan was working well. The stormtroopers pushed on through the gaps, leaving the strongly held redoubts, there's one in those trees over there, to the follow-up troops. Ludendorff had staked everything on a war of movement. Now it seemed that the Western Front might be broken at last, not by the Allies, but by the Germans. At 9.40 that morning, the Germans were up here on Manchester Hill fighting hand-to-hand -hand with Elstob's men. The attack began with machine guns and grenades and ended with field guns being fired point-blank into the position. At about 11, the fog began to clear and the Manchesters could see that there were Germans on all sides of them. Elstob used his field telephone to call down artillery fire around his own position. Then he darted about with revolver and grenades, inspiring his dwindling band of soldiers. He was wounded three times by splinters from these German stick grenades. At half past three, he used the phone again to tell brigade headquarters that he had very few soldiers left and that the end was close. Shortly afterwards, he was shot through the head. The defence of Manchester Hill was an epic, which earned Elstob a well-deserved Victoria Cross.
Yet even the Manchesters, brave as they were, lost many prisoners. Elsewhere, battalions often gave in once the Germans had got behind them. By the end of the day, the Germans had captured thousands of prisoners and the British were in full retreat. There was a nasty mist turned up and the visibility was very poor, 50, 20 feet, that sort of thing. And the, uh, it was, the attack was well organized by the Germans. They practically surrounded those two companies and took uh, some chaps were killed, of course. Others wounded and taken prisoners, taken prisoner without even being wounded. And we lost fatally two companies the first day. Many of the retreating soldiers had little real experience of fighting a defensive battle. And many of them were just 18 years old. The privates were nearly all children, tired, hardly able to drag their laden shoulders after their aching legs. Here and there an exhausted boy trudged along with tears coursing down his face. Some officers tried to hold the flood of retreat. Major Harrison Johnston of the Cheshires was defending a line of a thousand yards with just 150 men. I was roped in to assist some staff officers in stopping the rot and making men return and reinforce our new positions. Revolvers had to be produced and it was extremely difficult to hold the mob. Nothing seemed able to stop the Germans. On Easter Sunday, the shells were crashing into the medieval heart of Amiens. From here radiated the railway network that nourished the French and British armies. If the town fell, then the Germans might achieve their dream of splitting the Allies. The French would turn to the defense of Paris, the British to holding the Channel ports. Five days after the German attack began, the Allies were in crisis. On the 26th of March, a fleet of staff cars swept into the courtyard of the town hall here in Douillon. In them were the British and French top brass. As they got out of their cars, they could hear the guns on the shifting front, only a few miles away. Haig was worried. He desperately needed French help. But Pétain, his French counterpart, made a gloomy prophecy. The Germans will beat the British in open field, and then they'll go on and beat us. Ferdinand Foch, a tough fighting general and leading member of the Allied Supreme War Council, bit back. There must be no more retreat the Germans had simply got to be stopped. Haig, sitting just here, made a remarkable concession. A document was drafted making Foch coordinator of all the Allied armies on the Western Front. United, the Allies might just stand. Divided, they would certainly fall. On the ground, confusion reigned. At the village of Bouchois, a few miles from Amiens, Lieutenant Pat Hakewill Smith occupied a trench with a company of men from the Royal Scots Fusiliers. They'd been told to hold the position at all costs. Then came an order from the adjutant to withdraw. Hakewill Smith and his men were glad to be out of the trenches, which had just come under murderous German artillery fire. As they were leaving, their colonel arrived and told them to go back to the trenches they'd just abandoned. They got there seconds before the Germans. A few hours later, they were ordered to withdraw again. They'd gone half a mile when a senior officer told them to retake the village. This time, the Germans were waiting for them. <laughs> 
They advanced over those ploughed fields as if they were going to work in the coal pit or shipyard under a hail of bullets. They whistled around their heads and kicked up little spurts of dust where they hit the ploughed ground. If you can imagine a pond in a hailstorm, you will have some idea of what those fields looked like. Most were killed or wounded long before they got anywhere near the village. The survivors limped back to join the retreat. Hakewell Smith was hit in the leg and was soon on his way to Blighty. In just two weeks, the Germans had advanced 40 miles. Many of the gains the British had made during the last three years were lost. And the Germans had perfected techniques to inflict maximum casualties. Round about three o'clock, the Germans started shelling us with gas shells, but literally by the hundreds. It was a bit breezy and the gas seemed to clear quickly. So after a short while, we were able to take our gas masks off, which was a great relief because the old head was a bit numb with the elastic band stretching over. Suddenly, without any warning, a high explosive shell burst on that, our parapet. The, the debris fell in around us, partly uh, buried us. I had a great big lump of hard clog hit me on the arm and I thought I'd got a blighty one. And uh, we followed it up immediately with a salvos of uh, gas shells again. There were four of us in my section. We were all gassed and vomiting badly and the eyes were beginning to close up and it affected the voice and uh, you were burned. By the 5th of April, the great German offensive had cost the British 160,000 men. But the very speed of the German advance was also its undoing. Men moved faster than the ammunition, guns and food they needed to sustain them. The British Army was well provided with bully beef, cigarettes, chocolate, even the notorious McConaughey pork and beans. As the Germans advanced, they overran a treasure trove of these supply depots. And there were cellars filled with wine and champagne. These were luxuries denied the Germans for the past three years. The advance slowed down in an orgy of plunder. The Germans would not give up their giant gamble. They attacked again in April, May, June and finally in July. But they'd lost about a million men. Many of them irreplaceable stormtroops who'd spearheaded the attack. And now the Germans were beginning to face fresh, keen Americans. On the 6th of June, US Marines began their attack on Bellow Wood, behind me, walking in long straight lines through the tall wheat that covered this field. There was an innocence to their tactics that European armies had long since lost. It was as if the machine gun had never been invented. The Marines paid a high price for their inexperience. Hundreds were cut down, on a day that looked more like 1914 than 1918. Before the war, Bellow Wood was the hunting ground of a French nobleman. It was thick with undergrowth as cover for game. The Americans had to fight their way through it, tree by tree and thicket by thicket. It was a battle of sniping and ambush, of bayonet and boot. The Marines lost 5,000 men and half their officers but they took the wood. German commanders had scoffed at the raw American soldiers. Now they'd been beaten by them. And they knew that the Americans could replace every casualty with 10 fresh soldiers. Throughout the summer, the strength ebbed out of the German advance. The great offensive had stretched the line of the Western Front to within a few miles of Amiens, but it had not been broken. <laughs> 
It's easy to imagine that Allied generals had learnt nothing from the ghastly bloodbaths of the last four years. Not so. On the 8th of August 1918, the British launched a counter-attack across this windy plateau and showed just how much war had changed. A massive bombardment began at 4.20 in the morning. Four minutes later, the infantry attacked, giving the Germans no time to prepare. The barrage continued, firing over the heads of the Australian, Canadian and British troops. When we advanced, we were kept about 20, 25 yards away. That was the instructions. Uh, and we could see the shrapnel whipping up the ground, sort of, almost like a mist. It was most effective, a creeping barrage. They kept the Germans down, head down and gave you time to follow up, follow up your attack. They were backed by 450 fighting tanks. Above, 800 aircraft circled the battlefield bombing and staffing. Many Germans simply bolted or surrendered, morale crumbling as the tank armada obliterated their trenches. The Germans had lost 50,000 men, 30,000 of them captured. They were on the back foot at last. Small wonder that Ludendorff called it the black day of the German army in the war. By September, the Allies had pushed the Germans back to where they'd started from in March. The Hindenburg Line was protected by belts of wire, bunkers and gun emplacements. It ran for many miles along the St. Quentin Canal, whose steep banks gave the Germans good cover. The St. Quentin Canal runs for over three miles through this tunnel. The Germans housed hundreds of troops in barges down here, safe from the fiercest Allied bombardment. A warren of tunnels ran up into the villages above, which were themselves strongly defended. All in all, it was a formidable obstacle, and there were fears that the line might become another Somme or Passchendaele. But British commanders had learnt from the bitter disappointments of previous years. Finally, they had weapons and tactics that gave them the edge over the exhausted German defenders. And now the battle was moving at a new, quicker tempo. Allied artillery had become devastatingly effective. Early on the 29th of September, an intense barrage crashed down onto the Hindenburg Line. After 10 minutes, the infantry, American, British and Australian went over the top. The infantry of 1918 had learned from the bitter lessons of the Somme and Passchendaele. They moved quickly, took cover when they had to, and were fully backed by tanks and artillery. The scene looked more like 1940 than 1914. Here are the soldiers of a British division, 46th North Midland most of them territorials from pottery and mining towns, slipped down the bank to cross the canal. Many of them had got hold of life jackets from cross-channel ferries, so the water wasn't really much of a problem. The Allies needed a bridge to get guns and supplies across the canal. Without it, their advance might falter. This bridge at Ricaval was intact but prepared for demolition. The Germans didn't want to blow it too early as they still had men on the far bank. It was covered by a machine gun post not far behind me. Early that morning, Captain Charlton of the North Staffordshires rushed the machine gunners with nine men and took them by surprise. They came on across the bridge, cut the wires leading to the detonators and chucked the charges into the canal. Breaking the Hindenburg line was a triumph for Haig and his allies. It was proof that they'd finally mastered the art of attack. But still the Germans fought on. He went around to the, to the Hindenburg line and, uh, and me and a friend of mine, uh, 
went down into this dugout, and uh, they'd been Germans, been there for a year, could have been there for two or three years. They had tables and chairs there, and been all like a room, you know, and far different from our dugouts. And uh, there's a bottle of wine on the table, and uh, this this friend of mine. He says, we'll have that. So we, we took this bottle of wine up, up onto the, out to the dugout, and he pulled the cork out, and, and it was a booby trap. It, it exploded and uh, blew all his inside out. He died, died at my feet. I could have picked it up, but he picked it up first, and it, it, it was booby trap. He died. The Germans, too, were bleeding to death. Their morale was rocked by defeat and news that Germany was starving. The military leadership handed power to a civilian government which asked for a ceasefire in November. Fighting went on to the last bitter moment, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. The last British soldier killed in action fell that very day. The war ended with the British armies at Mons, the little Belgian town where they'd fired their first shots in August 1914. I still find it hard to believe the sheer scale of the human suffering represented by the Western Front. It cost the British Empire almost a million men and twice as many wounded. More than 1,300,000 Frenchmen were killed and another 2 million wounded. The Germans suffered over 4 million casualties in the West. I've been visiting the Western Front for the past 30 years. During that time, its scars have softened, and so many of its veterans have faded away. But it still casts a long shadow over the end of the century. It helped make us more inclined to question, less prepared to obey blindly, less prepared to sacrifice our lives, or our children's, to try to change the world. For me, it's a war with more heroes than fools or villains. And in a place like this, I cannot but remember that the least of them is as much a man as I am.